Today's episode of Vice Versa, Tesla leads battery cell cost, GM reveals their next-gen battery, VW and Toyota tease some big announcements, Jeff Bezos is gonna spend $10 billion to fight climate change, and much more. And as usual, I'm joined by Ricky Roy. How you doing, Ricky? Doing good, Matt. How about yourself? You know, we, uh, we're we on number 17 of these. I'm back to work. This is the first episode uh, of the show since I've been back to work, so that's a little bit different. But doing well. How about you? How was your video this week? Uh, the video's been pre doing pretty well. It's uh, about geothermal heating and cooling for your home. I, it's something I really want to do for myself. It's just a question of, does it make sense here, or should I wait till my next home to do it? But it's such a cool technology. In your thumbnail, I think I saw that it was running along in your driveway. Are you trying to like never have to shovel your driveway? Is that the <laughs> yeah to heat my heat my driveway so it just melts off the snow? Yeah, that's I'll, <laughs> sign me up for that. I'll, I'll take that if, if that's available. Yeah, this video this week I'm going to be doing a video with Tesla solar roof and kind of seeing if it's just another toy for the rich or is there actually a chance that that can come down market and and make itself available to more buyers and stuff. But that one probably will go out on Saturday. Awesome. So let's jump right into it and yeah. talk about our first story. So, you know, there's so many things that I see a lot of people creating models and pro projections for Tesla stock price, things like the robo taxi network and stuff. But I maintain what I what I'm so bullish about Tesla is their cell supply and their cost for doing their cells. Here's a picture of their 4680 cell coming off their line. And, you know, we talked about last week, they're going to be manufacturing these themselves and also offloading it to other companies to make. But according to this report, Tesla pays on average $142 per kilowatt hour. And, you know, the, the nearest competition, maybe you can say AM, who pays about 169 And the average for the industry is about 186 So that means you're paying like 30, 35% more per kilowatt hour than and this is where I think the lead that Tesla has is going to, to increase. So here they mention how that translates to the cell uh, to pack cost. And again, Tesla's way out ahead. The cool thing, and we've been talking about this for a while, is GM is kind of right behind them here at about $207 per kilowatt hour in, a, in the pack total cost versus Tesla at $187. But I think this is the part that is the runaway success part of, of Tesla that people aren't fully appreciating. Because what ends up happening is we talk about all the stuff that is doing so so well compared to other people. But really that margin, they're making 20 to 20 something percent per car that they sell. And that is really good for the automotive industry. And I think what's going to happen is the electric motor and batteries when they, the costs come down will prove that EVs are actually cheaper and more profitable to make when you figure out the supply. So GM with the Ultium, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in a future story, but GM is investing in similar stuff with LG. And so you can see where the companies that have taken the battery supply to the right level are, are thriving right now. And when you're trying to make a million cars a year, that little difference is going to be massive. It's, it's not such a big deal if you're making a luxury car like the Model S, you know, Lucid Air. If you're going to sell like 50,000 units, not the end of the world. But if you're trying to make a million ID3s or you're trying to make, you know, a large scale production, Tesla's lead here, I think, is one of the industry leading parts that we can't talk enough about. Yeah, I agree. I mean, everything you said, I agree with. I'd add to that, this article, the 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 numbers they came up with are little dubious at best. It feels like they got the apples to apples between the companies correct, like the spacing, but the actual numbers seem off considering um, it was 2018, Elon had mentioned that he expected them to get below $100 per kilowatt hour within a year. And that was 2018, but yet they're putting them at 142, which seems a little too high. And I was listening to the Tesla Daily Podcast, which if you guys don't listen to it, I bet you do, but if you don't, you really should check it out. He made a really good point in uh, an episode where he talked about this exact thing. He pointed out that in um, Tesla Battery Day, they talked about how they were going to be reducing costs by 56%. And in a different interview, Elon talked about tr their total target is going to be getting to around 50 to $55. So if you kind of do the math backwards, you end up with about 125 bucks per kilowatt hour right now. So it's like, it looks like 
the numbers they came up with are off. And it makes you wonder how far they're off for pretty much everybody. But the bottom line still is Tesla's got a commanding lead on this and they're innovating in ways to try to get that that overall cost down to get to a super affordable EV and has still have a good profit margin for a business. So it's 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 really kind of interesting to see how this is playing out, and especially with GM. It's interesting to see GM is kind of in the second place right now with trying to with their better technology. Yeah. As far as inaccuracies or, or where the prices yeah. are currently, if we kind of normalize it and figure at least we can kind of get a general trend through yeah. the data that might be easier because some of this data might just be really hard to get. If you factor in like the R&D that Tesla is spending, does that go into battery pricing? Is it just from, do you pay for the leasing for the mid buildings? How many cells are you scrapping? There's, it's actually a pretty hard number to nail down. Also, uh, to, to, to the point about what Elon mentioned, that is the full cell to pack uh, savings. Because if you're yep. going to go structural pack and some of the other innovations that they have there, it's not just that the cells are cheap, but it's when you stick them all the way into a pack, that savings is going to be really massive. So the, the bottom line, like like you mentioned, potentially their their numbers might be even better than than what this report is saying. But you're going to compete with Tesla now, who's already making half a million EVs compared to everybody else. And you're playing catch up. If you're building the Mach-E and you're paying this much per kilowatt hour, how are you going to be competitive with the, with the Model Y? And that kind of goes down the market. So. This is the unsung hero that Tesla, this is the advantage that Tesla and their stock price have that I think cannot be understated, uh, overstated enough. Yeah, I agree. Definitely agree. Ready to go to the next one? Yeah. So next up, what would you do if you're the richest man in the world? How about spending $10 billion over the course of 10 years to combat climate change? Because that's exactly what Jeff Bezos has said he's going to do over the next de decade with his Earth Fund that he set up. Um, he set it up, I think it was last year. Uh, this announcement is, is it's so important because it's money like this that's going to spur development in the private sector, in the uh, public sector. It's going to be helping fund researchers and scientists doing research into new technologies and ways to combat climate change. It's It's things like this that are so important to pretty much everything. And it struck me funny because it's like, it's, he's kind of pulling off of Bill Gates right now, how the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates has been pouring billions of dollars of his own money <laughs> into the Gates Foundation to help, you know, with vaccines around the world and to obliterate all these diseases. And he's investing in things like nuclear power. It's interesting to see the other richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, doing basically doing the same exact thing where he's going to be investing tons and tons of money into this. Um, some, some of the details out of this are uh, he they recently hired Andrew Steer to be the CEO of Earth Fund. Um, the first round that they put in all this year so far has been into um, nonprofits. And Bezos has also said in separate interviews that, that the 10 billion is just to start. So it would not be surprising if he continues to dump more money into this over the next decade and beyond. So what, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think the, the, the parallels to, to Bill Gates are, are, are right there. We mentioned previously he's stepping down from the CEO role, which I think yeah. surprised me. We, we should have probably seen it coming. He's pretty much accomplished all you're going to accomplish. He's fundamentally changed the world in terms of how you buy products and everything else. And Amazon is just a complete behemoth. But the next step for him is to do some uh, philanthropy. So the, the reason why I was interested in this story is the details are a little bit scarce, right? We don't really know exactly what he's what he's um, planning. I'm sure he's gonna do some really great stuff. And anybody out there who has a, a nonprofit, you know, make sure to write these guys and like pitch and make sure you get funding or whatever for whatever cool things you're doing. But I brought this up because I think he's trying to compete with with Elon as like the world's most important man, if you will. And the difference really is with Elon, his business itself is doing good. Like what Tesla is doing for the world is is really almost unbelievable. Nobody would have believed that they could do this maybe 20 years ago. Whereas with Bezos, it was kind of like, let's build and make mil billions and then go try to find ways we can save the world. So for me, I love when the business itself is the world saving. I, I was just reading an article and we're going to be doing a future video about this cool startup that's building like an electric solar powered boat that will automatically uh, 
filter out trash coming down from rivers before it ever reaches the ocean. Huh. This company is going to make money because they're going to sell these and they're going to go put them into rivers. What they found was, surprisingly, a lot of the trash that ends up in the ocean comes down just a few rivers. I mean, it's not a few, but the point is if we could capture it before it ever got to the ocean, it gets way cheaper to do it that way than by the time it's in the ocean and that cost becomes much higher. So I just love the idea of like business where the business itself is the doing good. Um, I work at Salesforce. Mark Benioff has a very similar philosophy where he believes like business should be in the business of doing good, not just making money. So um, I think in that way, I don't know that Amazon has done all that much. I mean, I'm sure they have, they've done donations and charity contributions and stuff, but now game on Jeff Bezos. What will you do next? And yeah. um, I'm sure it'll be pretty, pretty great stuff. I, I'm sure he'll, he'll figure out the right causes, but yeah, it, good for it, him. It, I, I did want to put something into perspective. There was a number I found. Uh, to put it in context, in 2019, of all the foundations that were giving money into like climate change, it was $1.6 billion combined in 2019. Really? So, and now here he comes in just dropping another billion on top of that. So, like, this a billion is a year. Yeah. 10 years. He's, he's, yeah, it's, that's incredible. Well, that, that context really changes it too. It's, it's hard to, really know what a billion is but when you put it in that way that's fantastic yep. good for him next all up. right the next story that we're going to talk about is one near and dear to my heart because i've been riding motorcycles for about 15 years i i don't ride now uh, after we had kids but studies show that about 50 percent of riders are looking to switch to electric motorcycles this particular uh survey was done in the uk but the reason why, and this is one of these, uh, I'm not sure which one this is, but there's quite a few, uh, Zero, uh, Robert is in the in the chat, and he, he converted a uh, old gas motorcycle to electric at fully charged last year. But this is a interesting part of the market because motorcycles in the U.S. don't have to be smogged. And so what ends up happening is in the interest of performance, you actually have motorcycles polluting a lot more than the average car. So my, I used to have a Honda CBR 600 RR. It was a, a sport bike and a little 600 CC motorcycle would actually pollute more than like a Honda Civic or a Honda Accord even. And the reason is, well, first of all, they're allowed to, and you don't have to smog them. So they go after like the pure performance, every last horsepower they can get. Yeah. Robert mentions that he loves his zero, but that is, I mean, it's not a really a big market in the U S there's not that many motorcycles, but globally there's, there's countries where more people have scooters and mopeds and motorcycles and they do cars. So if we had a purely electric alternative, I think in terms of like the carbon emissions of the world, it would go a long way. Now there are some other concerns, for example, safety, right? Noise and loudness is a is never a bad thing if you're on a motorcycle and you're sharing the road with cars that can't see you. And um, I'm curious how Robert feels about having a really quiet little electric motorcycle, but you know, it's not a perfect thing, but I'm kind of kind of excited to see that that many people are are looking to to change and long way up the long way up probably yes. had a had a big thing to do with that yeah that sh that show single-handedly like sold me on rivian <laughs> i'm not a motorcycle rider but it's like it sold me on those 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 motorcycles it's it's incredible what that show kind of showed off one of the things from that article that kind of stuck out to me was uh that the of all the people that they, they surveyed the majority of them were not in it for the environmental benefits. They were in it for the torque and the performance and the ease of maintenance. They were in it for all the other benefits of an EV. And from the feedback I've gotten on my channel and from talking to people out there, it, I've gotten the similar sense that most people love their Tesla for the performance and the ease of maintenance. It's not that they're necessarily drawn to it for the environmental benefits. They're drawn to it because it's just an amazing product, really fun to drive and own. And it doesn't shock me that for a motorcycle, it's going to be the same thing that the majority of them just want to get a really good performing bike. And if you can make it electric and it's better than the gas counterpart, it's like, it's going to just drag everybody over. They're just, they're going to want that better product. Yeah, exactly. Somebody mentioned like lawnmowers and other two stroke, even kind of appliances. Yeah. These are the kinds of, we think about big cars, but there's a whole slew of other products, you know, uh, uh, snow blowers and I have a, I have an electric lawnmower those benefits are huge. I don't have to worry about, I remember when I had a gas mower and my parents had this problem every year, they forgot to empty the gas out of the carburetor. It's flooded. It's not starting and the spark plugs are bad. 
every year they have to like go get a tune up and take it to somebody before they can operate it again. My electric, I just put the battery in, I hit start, and it just starts right up. The yeah. benefits really are are there, and that's what we have going for us in this fight with electric vehicles and electrification. Is it's a better product. We have that going for us, which is which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. Re- directly related to that, the next story is GM revealing their next gen lithium metal battery cell prototype. This is like hot off the presses, like today. This is kind of big news. They've partnered with a company called Solid Energy Systems that's actually here in the Massachusetts area. It's in Woburn, Massachusetts. And they've de- they've developed a new kind of battery, which is a thin lith- uh, lithium metal anode replacing the uh, graphite anode of a battery. And it has the potential, the potential to double the energy density and cost and save 60% of the cost, which is just... <laughs> Astonishing. Basically, almost like doubling the range for almost half the cost is basically what this battery technology can do. And it's gone through 150,000 miles in the um, simulation, which means that it was, they were testing the battery cells in a way that would emulate what it's like inside of a car. So with temperatures and charging and discharging cycles, they tried to emulate exactly what it was like inside of a car and simulated 150,000 miles worth of driving. And it performed incredibly well. So when is this going to come out? That's the big question. GM is targeting to have this in a prototype line by 2023. And so when you compare this to something like solid state, when it, solid state batteries are still years away, even though we're going to start seeing prototypes coming out, you're not going to see mass production of solid state batteries for five plus years. This is much closer because it's not solid state. It's just switching out the anode for this lithium metal and lithium metal can absorb a lot more ions than graphite, which is why it gets doubles the density. It's going to be really interesting to see if they can pull this off by that timeline. Um, because I was looking in, actually looking into this company, and they on their website site, I think it was by 2022, this car battery is going to be available. So it's this announcement is a year after that. So it's like I'm kind of wondering like why is there's this disconnect between on their website they're saying 2022 and GM's not doing till 2023. Um, going to be curious to see how this plays out. But this got me really excited because this is giving you a lot of the benefits of solid state without having to wait for solid state. Yeah, and if you remember during the Ultium announcement, they kind of mentioned there was a guy, I think he held up. He's like, and here's a, a solid state battery. Kind of, kind of showing that like they're clearly looking to the future. And I don't really actually know if Ultium is in production today or if they'll wait until such a time that they have maybe this lithium metal anode or a solid state battery or something else before they start manufacturing. But this is really, this is really a big deal. You know, it's cool in the, in the uh, quantum scape presentation, they mentioned that the very first charge cycle, the anode is actually, it's like there's no real anode and that the, the lithium that gets deposited in the first charge is when the, the anode actually forms. The, the, the impact on energy density is, is huge. I wonder if, I'm, I'm actually kind of curious, yeah, if, if they still have a gel, a liquid electrolyte, I'm kind of curious, like what keeps other companies from, from tackling it this way? Like why is lithium metal not talked about more? I have some yeah. kind of questions like that. Oh, there's, there's a ton of questions. Like when I was looking into this, it's like, the other thing that I find interesting is they're in Woburn, Massachusetts. And I don't know what's up with Woburn here in Massachusetts, but there's three major kind of like research companies into batteries. There's a solid state company. Actually, what was it? It was uh, Ionic Materials makes solid state batteries. Uh, Then there's Leo Nano, which is building out the next gen cathode materials. And then there's this company building out this lithium metal. It's like, what's in the water in Woburn? I don't know. (laughs) I'm trying to figure that out. But it's, it's from everything on their website, they were kind of throwing shade on solid state. So it's like, it, it's not clear if they're using a gel electrolyte or something solid because they were basically saying solid state's still years away. There's still many t- problems to tackle and ours brings things to the market much faster and gets you a lot of the same benefits. So it's, they're kind of, obviously there's some secret sauce here that they're not revealing quite yet. And I'm really, really interested in the details. I wanted to dig deeper on them and find some of their papers to see if I could get some more details on exactly what's going on. Yeah, it sounds like we're both going to have to cover that in, in future videos. But 
Um, talk about game changing. Talk about the kind of thing that if if GM had this in their battery supply chain, uh, that would be that would be a big deal. So we'll we'll definitely circle back around and talk more about this. But this is kind of I mean. I'm not surprised the Massachusetts area probably has some of the smartest in the world, if not the smartest people in the world. So that's how kind of centers of excellence kind of kind of start. So it sounds like you're going to be close to the, the, the heart of the all, all the, of all the action going forward. Yeah. In Woburn. OK. <laughs> Woburn. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like I got to come visit. All right. Next up. So next up, we have a couple of stories about <clears throat> legacy makers unveiling and kind of teasing some stuff out. The first Toyota teases a picture of their all-electric car. Now, this particular car that they're showing here, uh, article says, might only come to Europe, so we might not see this here in North America. But to my mind, kind of looking at it, kind of looks like the Toyota, I think it's the CHR, that little, really tiny little compact crossover type of a car. But, you know, they're, they're trying to keep the attention on the fact that they're they will have stuff into the future. You know, they were supposed to have the solid state battery announcement at the Tokyo uh, Olympics last year. I haven't heard much about that since that time, but I think it suffices to say that they're not going to have any sort of a production battery uh, in time. But yeah, this is a look at what they're what they're teasing. I think at this point, for a company like Toyota, it, it has to be more than teaser. Like at this point, we we need to see something like solid. We need to figure out. Where's your supply going to come from? What's your strategy? What kind of platform are you building it on? And I think for Toyota, this is still kind of a weird half measure. That yes. They have to eventually like jump in and say, we're doing this. We have cool cars coming up and, you know, and, and finally just do it. Yeah. For it, it, this announcement, it wasn't this teaser. It wasn't even clear that this is electric. We're kind of guessing it's electric because the fascia of the car doesn't have any kind of grill. <laughs> So that's kind of where it's leading everybody to think, oh, this must be fully electric and not some kind of hybrid. But it's it's one of those, I hope this announcement next week isn't a sad trombone being played. I hope it's genuinely something really exciting coming from Toyota because we need to see something really kind of game-changing for them to show that they're taking this seriously. Yeah, I, I, I agree. The cool thing is the, the next story, which is about VW, is a little bit more more optimistic or more positive because they're taking a page out of Tesla's pay playbook and kind of doing what Apple did. Like there was a time before, before Apple that you didn't have events to unveil products. You just made stuff. And then Apple kind of, and Steve jobs made every new version of the iPhone and the iPad, like a, a, a treat. It was an event. And then Google comes along and has Google IO day. And it's the same thing. There's like excitement about new operating system changes and new APIs. Well, the same thing kind of goes with electric vehicles and VW now is going to have a battery day. So the first thing I'll say is if you're going to have a battery day, you better have some really cool stuff to talk about. It can't be <laughs> we're buying cells from LG. All right. See you guys next week <laughs> or see you <laughs> next year. They have to do some really great stuff. And I think they will. They've made some really interesting partnerships. They're working with companies. I remember there's one in was it Norway that is working on some solid state batteries and stuff. But generally, they're going to be at the heart of this because I think v, I, we've talked about it before. VW probably has the most to lose if they don't go electric. And I think for that reason, they're targeting cars. If you look at their cars, they're not like the avatar concept kind of stuff. They're building ID3, which is a really practical little hatchback for the European market. And the ID4 here for North America, again, it looks very conventional. It looks like a car that they're going to build a lot of. They've had struggles. They've had battery supply issues and stuff, but, um, they're passionate about the future. And I think, yeah, you have to have a really good battery strategy if you want to win at this. And so I'm at least excited to know that they're thinking about things like this and yeah, holding no. that event. Even though it is a little like, looks like they're copying Tesla. It's like, this is what we need all these car companies to do. It's basically show us their cards, like show us what your plan is, show us what your roadmap is for the next three, five, 10 years. Show us what crazy technologies you've been working on that you've been doing in secret that shows shows us what you're planning on doing and where your products are going to be going. I have high hopes. I hope I'm not crushed, <laughs> but I have high hopes for this event next week from VW. I'm tentatively optimistic for Toyota, but it, next week, these two events happen two days apart. So it's like it's the 15th and the 17th, I think. So next week's going to be kind of a, a, a big week 
for kind of automotive news for electric vehicles. It's going to be an in interesting week. Yeah, I was just, uh, there were some questions that we'll get to in a minute about batteries. But yeah, it should be a really fun week. And to be honest, I think they're going to announce things like we're building a, a million square foot battery factory. That's going to be the announcement. And it's yeah. going to be maybe a new cell. I actually don't know. Do, what does VW do? They, I think they use like a, a prismatic cell currently or a pouch. But I, I whatever think it's the gonna, case is. Yeah, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be some kind of factory, something like that. It's going to be. I, I, Tesla kind of dropped the mic on their battery day and it was kind of like, this is how you do it. And so I think the other car companies are going to try to emulate that. So I don't think they would hold an event that would just come out and go, like you said, we're partnering with LG. Yay. It's like, I, I think they would know that that's not going to go over well. I think they know they have to deliver. So the fact they're holding an event to me says they, ha they think they have something worth an event. And so hopefully they deliver. They kind of have to at this point. They've yeah. had delays due to battery constraint. And, you know, we've talked about the, the really aggressive deadlines, you know, for the UK banning new car sales. Those dates are coming up. We're in 2021. Next thing you know, and we're already a quarter of the way through 2021, which is crazy to me. But <laughs> here we are. So the next thing you know, VW is going to be backing up against the wall if they don't do this. So I think they have... You know, we talked about it before. Deese, their CEO, really, I think, gets it. I think he's got the right support structure in place. And I wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, the announcement is, like, just a factory at the scale of which even, like, maybe bigger than the gigafactories that they've built so far. Yeah. Well, that was the last last stories that we were going to talk about tonight. So we're going to transition now over to the Q&A. Chime off, sound off in the, the comments if you have any questions, thoughts, whatever. And also, we forgot to mention at the beginning, but... If you haven't subscribed and you're watching us for the first time, please subscribe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where is it? Hit that. Hit that notification. Wait, 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 wait. Crush. Oh, we high five. High five. We didn't, we didn't do that. There, yeah. Boom. Here we go. Boom. High five. That, just ha that just happened. <laughs> yes. Again. Crush that like button and <laughs> yeah. demolish that like the notification bell. I don't know. Yeah. It's all the, <laughs> all the good stuff there. <laughs> yeah. So we're at 42 likes. I'm watching you guys. There's 115 of you uh, and 42 likes. So let's see if we can't get that number up a little bit. Yeah. The first question we got to go with is one that Jim Bates ha has asked a couple of times. Jim, I saw you. I didn't forget about you. I just wanted to get to this portion of the show. But he mentions or he asks, will other people make this 4680 cell? So the one thing is, you know, we're not going to have a standard when it comes to car batteries like we do with appliances. Like we have AAA and AA. How great is that, right? With a couple of rechargeable batteries, I can have all my little appliances powered. We're not going to do that for cars, I think. Maybe we will 10 years from now, but at this early stage, the 4680 is what Tesla is doing, and they will give, they're going to work with, I think they've already mentioned, Panasonic is going to be building these at Gigafactory. LG is going to be building these, and there's there's probably going to be even more partnerships. Tesla's happy to have anybody else build the cell to this specification using whatever maybe licenses that, that are needed, the tablet's architecture. I don't know if they have like a patent on that or not, or, or maybe the drive slurry. But they will be working with people to build as many of these cells as possible. Uh, absolutely. I see a debate about the uh, battery snowblowers in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Between and Katie, Katie and James. Katie, and <laughs> Katie sent you our email or on Twitter, but reach out to us because we're working on that video and we definitely want to talk to you about solar glass roof. I think she's she's a customer. I think she has it. And Katie also asked, where does Matt live? Matt lives in Massachusetts. So Yeah, I live in the Boston. The area. man knows his he knows his snow. Put it yeah. that way. He had over two feet in our front yard not too long ago. Really? Still? In March? It's well, it's actually got to sixty five today, so it's mostly melted finally. But yeah. Yeah. I... Jay Cronin asked, would Ultra capacitors help improve charge speed. They would, because ultra capacitors can can accept charge at almost like open it's almost voltage, instant. just yeah. almost instant. Yeah. The problem is like you know the the density of it and how much space it would take up. I've had this kind of conversation before, but I think for electric vehicles, the pack size is so large, and we have so many cells already that the amount that we can charge and discharge is so huge. Um, I, I I think ultra capacitors could potentially have a purpose, but um, I, don't, I don't think they need it. I don't think that's really the limitation. 
Thank yeah. you, John, for the super chat, by the way. John uh, Check is, is, is always a, uh, is an avid supporter. We appreciate you. Do you want to take that question? Uh, do you understand this FSD being released on the 16th? Does everybody get it? From what I understand, yeah. If you go in and you hit the button, <laughs> there's going to be some kind of beta button that's going to show up for everybody. And if you click it, you'll get it. Um, it seems a little like it's kind of a, I don't know, covering their bases legally of like, you know, making everybody, making sure everybody knows this is a beta. It's not final. If you click this thing, you agree to, you know, getting beta software. So I think that's probably why they're doing it the way they are. But, um, yeah, from what I understand, everybody can get it and you can bet your bottom dollar. I'm getting it. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. I will not be probably cause I don't, I don't have FSD, but we have to talk and see how you like it. Thank you, Rob Womack, for the super chat as well. Uh, we appreciate you. you. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, yeah. FSD is going to be a, is an interesting point. Maybe we should like dedicate an entire video to talking about it because I actually just was on an interview with 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 a uh, with another YouTuber talking about kind of my views on FSD. Clearly, Tesla has a huge advantage at this point, um, but there are other people doing interesting things. We talked about Cruise partnering with Microsoft, yeah. and you know. And there's Waymo in there somewhere doing some stuff. You you actually thought Waymo was pretty cool, and they've got some really interesting stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes for a pretty interesting conversation. What's really cool about Tesla is that they are willing to do stuff like this. It's pretty scary to imagine you're going to let like 100,000 people drive a, a a beta around. Yeah. That's not really normally done. I, I don't think GM and Ford would have the kind of... They wouldn't do it. Uh, the audacity to do that. So, they would not do very, it. There's no way cool. they would do it. <laughs> I think their legal team would be like, you are not doing this. But with Tesla, I, they're a little more willing to take risks and push the envelope a little bit. Yeah, I think the lawyers are way too uh, empowered at other companies. You know, like I was driving the Bolt and you start driving and this big pop-up says, you should not touch the screen and operate it while the car is in motion. I agree. And then this other one pops up and I agree. And like on my Tesla, I just live my life. I don't, I don't have any, there's, there's no lawyer, uh, UI, if you will. Yeah. Whereas with other companies, it's all over the place. And, um, I think that kind of shows you their, their engineering passion. Yes, Claudia. <laughs> Only 59 likes. Time to smash the like button. <laughs> and if you've already smashed it, don't do it again because you'll un unlike it. We don't want that. <laughs> um, John Chuck says he paid 7000 for FSD. 7000 sounds great compared to 10000 Um Still a lot of money. Uh, that's probably close. No, Matt, you paid maybe less. I think it was, was 2000 I think. It was, there was like a sale that they did. Right. It was like in January or February, like a year ago. And it was up there for like a week. And it's like I jumped on it when it dropped to that price. So Scott says, I see Tesla eventually having the 4680 standard across all their products. I think that's probably true. The only real exception to that would be that there's going to be companies that are still making 18650s. And so if Tesla does that, they would lose out on buying cells that are available to them. And so what's really smart with what they're doing is they're still using all of it up. Like the non-plaid versions of the Model S, uh, Model S, right, will use the 18650, which you would think, why don't they upgrade the 2170? Well, because there's supply over here and we don't want to lose it. If we start to cannibalize that, that means those are batteries that can't go into a million threes and whys around the world. So the, the tricky thing is going to be when the battery like supply shifts, like if people stop making 18650s and only have that, sure, Tesla will follow, follow suit. But at this point, why not buy what you can and, and um, put them into cars? There's also a use case that you have to think about. It's like, just because you can doesn't mean you should. It's like if you're building a smaller, cheaper car that only has to go 250 miles, it's like there's no reason to go with these crazy larger batteries that might be more expensive or hard to get when the smaller cells work just fine and get you the same results for the same amount of money or less. So it's like it, it, its use case is also part of that conversation. Yeah, good point. Very good point.
Bong Hollywood. What do you guys think of Tesla installing Starlink on their Tesla Semi? I've got a, I've actually got a video coming up where I interviewed a good friend of mine who went to RV living. He converted an RV, installed solar batteries, the whole thing. He's been driving across the country, working remotely. And one of the things we talked about was, did he get Starlink? And he, we talked about how Starlink is not available yet for motion. And they just applied for that ability. And they're going to be doing it for RVs, trucks, boats, larger vehicles. I am really excited because that is like a prime candidate for that technology. Like my, my friend is a developer. He's a game developer. And it's like he works from his RV. <laughs> like right now he's parked on some beach in Texas right now. And so it's like next week he could be in Arizona. And it's, But if he had a uh, Starlink on his thing, it's like he wouldn't have to worry about his internet connection. Right now he's got three different cell services. He's got a modem that has backups. So you put multiple SIM cards in. If one's too weak, it'll go to the next one. He's got these antennas, one that's kind of like an omnidirectional and this like you, like very directional one, depending on what's going on and what he needs to do. And it's like, if he just got Starlink, all that goes away. <laughs> it's like, it'd be amazing. I'm really excited for that. Yeah, that's probably the use case that I'm the most excited about as well. We did an RV trip a couple months ago and while we're up in, through the mountains near Lake Shasta in Northern California, we had no reception. We couldn't call anyone. We couldn't put an order. We couldn't do anything. And if I could just drive around in an RV and have internet wherever I go, I mean, how yeah. cool is it? Even with your, for your friend system where like he has Verizon and T-Mobile, AT&T, just in case whoever has the best service at that spot, yeah. you're still, you're going to encounter places where there's just no reception. And with this, those places are usually like very like, you know, empty and open air. You'd have like the best reception with, with Starlink. Yep. I'm really excited about that as well. Uh, every time me that, about your friend who's done this, I'm like thinking about telling my wife, all right, hon, let's pack it up. We're going to take <laughs> these two crazy kids and we're going to do a little road trip. Uh, maybe in a couple of years when they're a little bit older, but that sounds so cool. I'm kind of curious if they can shrink that down. The dish is not a small no. dish currently. And if you're going to be, you know, catching... If you're going to be receiving these uh, signals on the go, I wonder how tiny they could make that receiver. From what I understand, they can make it smaller, but I think it's going to affect the potential bandwidth yeah. of the signal you can get. So it's like if you shrink it down, a car doesn't need to have a 10 gig, you know, megabit connection. They could have something much slower. So you could shrink it down. Very good point. Now, Dan mentions that a friend of his in Vancouver Island has Starlink and he's getting 220. I'm guessing it's megabit. Got to be megabit. Is, which, is, which is solid. It's really pretty pretty amazing for a satellite. But that will go down the more people that get it in his area. That's, that's the downside. Yeah. That's a good point. Dan also had a really funny comment that um, I think you should address. Dan asked, did your mom dress the two of you this morning? <laughs> is it because we're both wearing gray? Is that why? <laughs> it's like each week we're kind of semi-coordinating. It's not intentional. Uh, Dan, uh, Robert Powell says they can get it down. I think he's talking about the Starlink uh, satellite size via phase array, which is very interesting. And they, they filed for a patent, which is how I think we found out about this. So yep. they're, they're probably cooking up something, which is going to be really cool. My friend ordered Starlink and technically you can only order it if you have like a home address. So I think he ordered it to his father's address and he's just going to try it and see if it works like on the road when he finally does get it, which I don't think it's going to work the way he thinks it's going to work, but maybe it will. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have to make sure he, we get that answer from him and figure out how it, how it goes. Yeah. Let's see if there's any other questions. I had a question for James. Well, James said, Jeff Don felt the battery range was less important than most think. James, could you elaborate on that? I think he's right. <laughs> Do you mean that? Like EV range is not as important as people think. 
How many people own a car that can go 600 miles in a tank of gas? It's like you, yes, it's, yeah. the, the idea the idea of needing a car that can go six, 700 miles is addressing the issue of charging infrastructure and charging speed. If you make better battery technologies that can charge faster and charging infrastructure that can support it, you don't need batteries that can go 300 miles. I mean, 600 miles. You could get cars that go 250 and get exactly where you're going to, like you can today with a gas car. So it's like, I think that's probably what, I haven't seen that comment, but my guess is that's probably what Jeff Dunn's talking about. It's range is not the thing that we need to worry about. It's making more resilient batteries that last longer, can charge quickly. I'm guessing that's what he's he's focused on. Yeah, I, I hear you. The, the only caveat I would probably bring up is if it's cold and you're on the heater, you're not going to get 250. If yep. you're going 85, 80 miles an hour in the freeway, you're not going to get 250. And if you're going uphill and things. So I had, you know, I think I've told you that I tour my Tesla to let uh, get as many people driving EVs <laughs> as I can. And so a, a gentleman who, who had my car went up to Big Bear, which is a little ski resort in, in Southern California. It's not too far from here. But, you know, he so I had, he had a fully charged. He goes up to, you know, kind of San Bernardino. And then from there, he goes to Big to, to Big Bear. And I think it was only like a 60 mile trip, but it's uphill. So his range just like got eaten up. And the reason is because my car has a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack, which sounds really massive. But if you if you convert that to like the amount of electric, like energy in a gallon of gasoline, it's like a two and a half gallon tank. It's tiny. They're just so efficient that there's just not that much energy on board. And so things like going uphill or towing a trailer. What? Well, how about EV trucks, like the Cybertruck? If you're towing something, does range matter? There's there's some kind of... But he had a really rough time of it. He enjoyed the trip, but he didn't complain. But the whole time, because I can see how how he's doing on my phone, I was like nervous for him. Because like, oh man, what are you going to do? And the only destination charger that they had was out of commission. So he's charging it on a 110 in his Airbnb. Uh, it was just a little bit hectic. And so the entire trip was, I just felt a little tense. Whereas if it was a gas car, you just go in and, and fill it up, right? So yeah, on the way back, he would have been fine because he'll charge on the way back and stuff. But range is a funny thing. I, I'm I'm with people. I hear you for the most part, day to day, who cares? Just plug it in home and, and charge. But I think there are some interesting use cases where a little extra range would go such a long way. But gas cars suffer those same problems you just don't notice it because well, yeah the gas you can gas up on every corner 70 percent right and you can gas, <laughs> gas up on every cars, corner right so it's yeah. like it, a, a truck that's towing you know a two tons is going to be chewing through its gas just like it would with a battery the problem is our charging infrastructure is really thin right now it's it's not robust and then on top of that it's very slow so it's like if we can solve the slowness and the frequency of those charging stations I, I think you're, it's going to be more like a gas car experience. So at that point, why would you need a car that could go a thousand miles? It's like you, you don't need it. It's like there's a, there's a kind of a sweet spot. You know, if it's 400 miles range, it seems like it would be perfectly acceptable across the board. Yeah, exactly. And I've I've talked with Robert Powell about this. You know, charge point when they did, when they showed off the number of charges that they have, a lot of them are level two. Yeah, and. That's not going to cut it. I'm not going to wait 15 hours to charge up my car. I need a I need a DC fast charging spot. So hopefully, uh, the future, like take those down and, and in their place, build DC fast charging. We need that infrastructure uh, to roll out quickly. Yep, for sure. Thank you, Asterix, for the super chat. Um, he said you don't need a giant battery. 99% use case. Um, yep. Yeah, but the problem there then is you have to tell people that it could be a second car. That's kind of the way I look at this. If you have a gas car, like we have another car that's a gas car, you could say if I have 100 miles of range on an EV or 150 mile EV, that'd be fine. But if you're talking about telling somebody this is your only car and your family lives a you know a couple hundred miles away and you're going to road trip on occasion, how much range is, is needed? I'm kind of curious. What do you what do you think? What's a minimum? An asterisk. What do you think? What is a what is a, a minimum amount of range that you think every EV would be fine having? Yeah, everybody just chime in like what you think the perfect range would be for an EV. Because my take is 300 miles. It's like if you hit three miles or better, you're golden. Anything under 300 seems like not quite enough to me. Yeah, 
the good news is we are up at 78 so we're getting closer but still not to the 100 likes which i want to see so you know peruse over to that like button if you have a moment yeah people are saying 400 miles uh 350 250 okay there's quite a range um yeah my my number i think for me having a 300 mile range ev my number is 400 because there are times when i'm going really fast on the five from northern to southern california like 80 miles an hour you'll eat your you know your 300 miles really becomes closer to maybe 220 or so yeah and i would think 400 would be nice especially if like your kids are asleep like there are times when my wife and the kids are all asleep no one's asking to stop or take a break and i can just just go and the last thing you want to do at that point is like have to charge you know but i mean that's why i went with the long range model three it's because it was 310 I knew in the wintertime it might be 230. So it's like I didn't want to go below 200 on in the middle of winter. So it's like that's why I opted for the 300-mile one. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, the numbers are all over and the place. It's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'll say there's a trend in the 300-ish. I see yeah. 300 is on average. Um, Katie says 500. I'm not going to lie. There's, there's a couple of cars that I really have my eye on. The Cybertruck, 500 miles of range. The Plaid Plus Model S, 500 miles of range. Sadly, that went up $10,000 in price recently. I knew I should have bought it last week. And the third one, which maybe surprises people, is the Lucid Air that has the 500-mile pack size as well. Those are the three cars. So clearly, I think range for me does matter, especially because we drive a little more often. My mom and dad are 500 miles away. So... Um, <laughs> So 500 would be nice. 400, I think, though, would be would be great. And 300 that, does the trick. Look, I've funny. driven all this long. That is funny. Your family's 500 miles away. You want a 500-mile car. My my parents are about 300 miles away, 350 miles. So it's like, and I have a 300-mile car. So it's like, it's. I wonder if that has a lot to do with the number psychologically that we're kind of zeroing in on. Yeah, that's that's true. And to your point, Matt, Dan uh, Crow says, I'd kill for my Ford F-350 diesel to get 300 miles on a tank. <laughs> yes. And he probably has like a 30-gallon tank, and it probably cost him like $100 to fill up. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. W- what I was saying earlier was the gas car is so inefficient to begin with. Like 70% of it is wasted as heat to begin with. So if you're going uphill or if it's cold, and, well, if it's cold, it doesn't matter. It's free, like, free heat is available because all that waste. But yeah, EVs are so efficient that any little disturbance is like a huge impact. It's, it's funny. <laughs> uh, Dan is uh, clearly a, uh, is anti-lucid. Uh, he says you can park my lucid air beside your Nikola uh, truck. <laughs> I, 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 I don't fully understand that. There's a lot of anti-lucid sentiment. I, Maybe Dan, you can you can write what your reasons for why you say that. But um, <laughs> San Diego is expensive electricity. Uh, it costs yeah thirty five cents. Yep, that is true. It is expensive here. This is a video actually, Matt. I want to see you do. Um, we talked about. I was talking with one of my patrons on our Discord chat. And he brought up a great point, which is there's a lot of uses for petroleum beyond automotive range or fuel. You know, like pharmaceuticals use petroleum and like plastics for everything in our world, right? So what he was saying is if if oil, petroleum demands plummet, what happens to the need for other industries? Like the prices are going to go up for other products like oil, uh, like like plastics or like for pharmaceuticals and stuff. There's going to be like a, a reckoning when that demand curve shifts. And do, do you see any, any issues with the other industries that need petroleum when the demand wouldn't? Plunges? I'd have to look into this more, but wouldn't that like um, actually help those industries because you'd have more supply than demand? So the prices of oil would drop for those. So plastics could get even cheaper. I think if the demand fell sufficiently, you'd have to just shut down operations. Like it wouldn't right. even be profitable. So when that happens, the 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 supply will will con, uh, you know constrict very quickly. And so right. yeah, it's a weird thing. These these global markets are really hard to understand. But it's uh, 
it's interesting to think about what would happen. Well, and to argue for plastics, plastics are actually horrible for the planet. It's like, we should be wanting to get rid of plastics. So if that kind of went away and found a different alternative, that'd be better. But yeah, there's probably uses for oil that would, I'd have to look into it, but there's definitely uses for oil that would we'd still need. Lubrication, you know, yeah. there's a, our, our Teslas have various needs like that. Yeah. You know, I watched a, um, a Shark Tank episode where they were there. The product was a plant based plastic, which would bio decompose in about 150 days as opposed to like, so like it was for like dog poop, like for your pets kind of a thing. Yeah. But I've always kind of thought like you're taking organic matter dog poop and you're putting it into like this plastic mausoleum that'll never <laughs> biodegrade for the rest of time. That's what I it's use. It's like we, we buy these plastic bags that are made out of something that will biodegrade in like really 90 days or something like that. Hopefully all dog bags are because I don't know if they're mine not. are, but they're not. That's crazy. What a we, terrible, if They cost a little extra, but for me, it's like I can't justify putting my dog's poop in a bag that will just forever be locked away till the end of time. It's like, that's just like, I don't need to preserve this poop. poop. Why am I preserving this poop? That's yeah, poop. exactly. Exactly. So maybe we have to make that transition to, to other types of plant-based biodegradable plastics and stuff. In which case, maybe we have to just pay whatever the, the cost is at that point. But just say no to paper straws. Oh, God. Paper straws. Paper straws. <laughs> I go I strawless. I, go, <laughs> I don't need yeah. a straw. I'll go without a straw. I don't need a straw. A paper straw is like so bad. You know, I remember there's a, we had this um, design class in college where they talked about, you have to rethink stuff. Like the paper straw is a terrible idea. You're mm -hmm. trying to take the old way of doing something, a straw, and replace it with paper. But 10 minutes into drinking your drink, it's just a mushy lump of, you know, it doesn't even hold weight and water. <laughs> what I would rather see is like, a, I don't think Starbucks does this, like kind of a sippy cup lid where it'll still keep, like if, it, if it's an iced drink, it'll keep the ice from coming through, but it's just kind of a, like a little sippy cup. Yeah. And it's built in and now you have a lid. And what's crazy is when we have a paper straw, you still have a plastic lid. Yeah. <laughs> We're only halfway there anyway. <laughs> so why not get rid of the straw altogether? Yeah. I think we got to rethink some stuff. We have to kind of not just replace one thing for another, but kind of step back further and reevaluate how we do takeout, how we do delivery, how we, you know, create and use plastic and recycle plastic and all of it. Somebody's an engineer using first principles thinking here. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Like, let's go. Yeah, right, you and I, we're going to make a think tank. We're going to go get uh, Big Papa Jeff Bezos to fund it. And we're going to oh, come God. up with <laughs> Big Papa. Bong Hollywood says, I would rather drink out of a bowl before drinking out of a paper straw. Yes. I think that, that you get me. Up. You get me. That's all <laughs> I can say. <laughs> Thank you, John Chuck, again for the super chat. Now, I, I don't even want to think about his question. He says, how many medical surgical gloves are, are there that are dumped after one use? You know, I was at a, um, a poke place. I love poke. The people who work there, they put on plastic gloves, make my food, and then get it to the next person for the sauce step of the order. And they take off the gloves and they go over there and then they're back for the next person putting on gloves again. I was just thinking to myself, I wonder like how many pounds of plastic is wasted at that place. And that's just food delivery. For a surgeon at a hospital, you'd hate to be stingy, but I, I don't, I can't even imagine how much uh, latex and plastic and all the other stuff is, is, is used. Yeah. <laughs> James loves my idea and thinks I should pitch it to Starbucks. A very manly, uh, sippy cup. Yeah. You know, this ain't your grandma's sippy cup. We'll, we'll, we'll get the, we'll get the marketing people to work on that. Yeah. When you were describing it, all I could see was like a three-year-old with this little, like little <laughs> tumbler. It's like, <laughs> all, the, all the adults are going to start to look like like little children from uh, what was it Wally? -E? Like we're all going to be like these <laughs> overweight yeah. people with big sausage fingers, drinking out of our little sippy cup. <laughs> Nick has a great question, and I want I want to get your take first. Who oh, yeah. is closest to FSD besides Tesla? 
Great question. Great question. I don't know. I I think Waymo is closer than people think, and I know LiDAR's a crutch, and I agree that it's a crutch, but I think they're getting pretty close. Um, yes, it's going to have to be within prescribed areas, but if the car can drive itself without a driver in the seat, it's still self-driving. So I think they're the, probably one of the closer ones. But I still think Tesla is going to potentially beat them to it because of just how they're approaching it. I don't. I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. What if we do a episode about full self-driving we technology should. as like an entire episode? Like we should. Maybe next week or the week after. We we'll, should. We'll let you guys know because I'm doing a video kind of around this, and there's clearly a lot of questions and interest about it. I actually think, and I I want to I've put out some feeler emails to to really like sit down with their teams because you can't really figure out what's happening from a, like a company's press website. They, they they claim this and that, but what does it really mean? It doesn't really mean much. So mm -hmm. I'd love to like sit down with their teams and figure out. But two companies that stand out to me are Cruise, which mm -hmm. is um, is funded or you know is was invested by General Motors and Honda. So yep. I wouldn't be surprised if in some interval of time future General Motors and Honda products come with like the cruise center stack and they feed into the cruise ecosystem. And the second part is they partner with Microsoft on the back end. So talk about like heavy yeah. hitters, like having the right ecosystem in place. And the way you catch up to Tesla really is Tesla has, let's say half a million to a million cars on the road that are all feeding in, you know, we're all every, every mile you drive in a Tesla, you're helping them train their model, whether you know it or not. And so they just need to get that volume of, of cars. And the other is Mobileye, which is another company that I want to learn more about. Similar philosophy. They're partnering with a lot of OEMs, and they're supposedly in a lot of cars today. I don't really know what they're doing. Are they doing machine learning training? Are they like doing labeling and stuff, either automated or via human? There's just a lot of questions I have, but those two stand out to me as having the right approach to this and having the right sort of investment and partnerships to potentially mm -hmm. have a chance to, to compete well with Tesla. Yeah, I spoke to somebody. We'll talk that, I spoke to somebody that it works in automation. I mean, in a in the military, <laughs> so it's not stuff that you're going to be seeing anywhere. But it was that, that what they said to me was what they saw from Tesla. Remember when Tesla did their um, self driving event? Autonomy Day. Yeah, Autonomy Day. Uh, his reaction when he contacted me, we talked about it. Was they're doing things he's never seen done in the industry. So he was completely blown away. And this is somebody that's actually working on the same kind of technology, not for cars, but for other things. And it was, if he's blown away by it, it's kind of like, makes you wonder <laughs> what the other companies are doing. Like, so is Mobileye in the realm of where Tesla is and where Waymo is, or are they a little bit behind? That, that's it my comes down. Question. Yeah, it comes down to how they're, how they're aggregating data and sending it somewhere for processing and for feeding the machine. That really is what it comes down to is you gotta just have huge amounts of data that you can feed into the machine and continue to train it and, and, and make it better. There was a, we're gonna do this episode because I'm actually thinking maybe next week my video on my main channel is gonna be about this. I've been thinking about this a little bit, but there was a question earlier about what if, I'm trying to see if I can find it, okay. Pete Marshall says, what if regulators will not allow full self-driving? So I actually thought of a thought experiment. If, Matt, you want to go drive your vehicle, you go to the DMV and they give you an exam and they check your eyes and they say, you know, you can have corrective lenses or contacts or whatever you want, but you have to be able to read this sign from a distance, right? There, basically, there's like a requirement. And a lot of Tesla owners have, 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 have commented that, Everything we need for full self-driving is in our cars today. And I've, as an engineer, I, I don't have that kind of confidence about things. I, I'm a little more skeptical, and I'm not sure that I do. Um, we've, talked about how the, uh, we've talked about how the Tesla footage from our, from our cameras isn't the highest quality. If you look at your dash cam footage, it's pretty low quality, like one or two megapixel, which is fine. But what if the regulators require 
that you're able to detect an object at this distance and be able to label it correctly? And what if there's like a gamut of testing that they can automate your car through? And if your car passes, you're approved to operate. And if you're not, and what if that requires a higher resolution camera and more image uh, processing than our current Teslas are equipped with at that point, hopefully Tesla would have like a retrofit kit. They can come in, swap out the cameras. It's not going to be cheap, but maybe they could do it more reason why I believe the subscription is the way to go because FSD is a never ending thing. There mm -hmm. will never be a day when it's like, all right, mission accomplished. We have self-driving cars. I believe it's going to be a constant update system where you keep feeding in more information, more types of roads and conditions and crazy people doing crazy things on the road, especially as we're sharing driving cars with driverless cars. But I think with a subscription model, hopefully we could address that. But the regulator part of this is the part that is more of a challenge because you can't engineer your way around it. Yeah, I, I agree on the subscription side of things. It's It seems like the direction it's going because it's going to be an ever evolving, it's going to need constant work. So you need to fund that 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 process. Dan says that FSD is already 100% approved in Florida and cannot be regulated. Um, that sounds weird, but I'd have to look into that more. Um, and he says that it's safer today than a lot than the average 16 year old or 70 plus year old. Um, I've been in an FSD car. It wasn't perfect. Um, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I've, I haven't caused an accident in my 20 some odd years of driving. Um, so, you know, there's, I think there's, I mean, it's not perfect. If it was, it wouldn't be in a beta state. So there's still some room to go. Um, and I'm sure they'll do it. We're going to have driving cars, uh, driverless cars. And my argument is in 10 years, it'll be a commodity, meaning every car will drive itself. It won't be a yep. feature. It'll just be like, duh, of course we'll have it. That's how technology works. It'll just be built, baked right in. So the future is going to, it's going to happen. It's just kind of the inner, the intermediary stages are the tricky part. There's gonna be a day where we're not gonna be driving our cars anywhere. Yeah. Nobody's gonna nobody's I, gonna want to drive. I'm I'm okay with that. <laughs> you could take a nap. You could read a book. You could watch a movie. It's like who doesn't want to do that? Yeah, lax lifters. Yep. It can be regulated. Politicians will look to sensationalize any incident involving a self-driving vehicle. That's what I'm worried about happening as we're in the beginning of this transition is like any accident or anything, it's going to just get blown out of proportion. And then you're going to get politicians jumping, jumping the gun and putting regulations in place. And it's, it's depending on where you are, it could either stop it in its tracks, slow it way down. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm concerned about the regulation side of this and the adoption of it. There's also the, the job loss, which somebody on Twitter just reached out to me. He says he was a, he's a, a, a DoorDash delivery driver. And he was saying, if we have robo taxis, what happens to, I want to say in the U S it might be nearly 50%, 40 or 50% of all jobs done by men, mm -hmm. uh, involved driving long haul trucking, delivery, UPS, FedEx, you know, USPS. What happens to half of people, the people's jobs in 10 years if we have self-driving, right? There's a lot of questions. And so to your point about the becoming politicized, what happens when, let's say, you know, Louisiana or some state where all the truckers are, you know, there's, there's a huge trucking lobby, they're not going to be in favor of it. And they're going to, you know, there's going to be lobbying interests that try to keep this down. It's, it's going to be a battle. Um, but but I think everybody here in the chat probably understands that the technology is going to happen and you can't really stop technology. There are people who try, but I think what we probably need to be thinking is how do we adjust and how do we accommodate a world where your goods can be shipped across the country and you don't have to have a person behind the wheel of a, of a lorry to do it. Not, a to big get, rig. not to get too philosophical, but this is a can of worms. It's like automation is coming for all of our jobs. Like it's not Even just trying. Even you? Oh yeah, no. There's gonna be a, there's gonna be a automated me at some point. 
you know, but you know what I mean though. It's like, it's every job, most jobs can be automated in some fashion by machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics at some point. Uh, there's going to be a, a wave coming in the decades ahead of just humans being replaced by automations. And it's, we have to figure out how to handle this because it's, it's coming. We have to figure out how to, hand, how to handle it. Guys, we're at 94 likes. We have never hit a hundred. Six of you quick, go <laughs> hit that like button. It's 908 too. We got we to gotta stop. This. We got to, we got to, we got to call it. Yeah. Come on, yeah. come on, come on. We got a minute. Seven people, seven people. Come on. But yeah, this is going to be the central kind of thesis of, of how Tesla shares are going to go from here. Like everyone's modeling and predicting of, of, of their share price is largely contingent upon the delivery of FSD. But as I mentioned, I actually think their sell advantage is the part that we should be talking more about. Because mm -hmm. you can't just flip a switch and say, you know what, we're going to make a million EVs now. It's not that easy. And Tesla's invested in that. But we, we shall see. 100, 100 likes. We did it. <laughs> all right. That's all, folks. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And as always, being great in the comment section. Oops. All right. Yeah, so thanks so much for everybody for, for watching and for listening. If you're listening to the podcast and if you think we've earned it, Hit the subscribe button. And to all of you that have been hitting the like button, thank you very much. Watch us every Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, or listen on the go by subscribing to the podcast at viceversa.show. And uh, thanks again. We'll see you in the next one.